If it have your attention, we want to go ahead and begin tonight. Thank you so much for uh, being here. We appreciate uh, your presence so much. I remind you, of course, that these are being uh, videoed and live streamed. Uh, you are able to share those uh, via Facebook. So if you want to help spread the word about this, we certainly would like for you to do that and encourage you to do that. Glad you're here tonight to be a part of this seminar together. It's good once again to have our brother Brad Hare with us. As you know, uh, Brad is the co-founder of Focus Press, uh, co-author of Think Magazine. He's written numerous uh, books and articles. There's several things out there on the table that he has been a part of, uh, DVDs and different things to help people understand more about uh, apologetics, Christian evidences, existence of God, and helping us to better defend our faith in the world in which we live. And uh, as you have figured out already, uh, the world has rapidly changed over the last several years. And uh, we really have to, with a lot of people, when it comes to evangelism, we've got to, we've got to go back to the beginning and really talk about some of this stuff. So we're, we're glad to have uh, uh, Brad with us uh, tonight. I'll let him tell more about himself if he would like to. And as far as the schedule and everything goes, uh, we're going to begin as we did last night with a song and a prayer. And then we'll turn it over to Brad and let him speak to us tonight. Good evening. If you would stand with me, we'll sing number 23. We'll sing all four verses. Number 23. Our God, He is alive. There is the
Would you bow with me, please? Our loving Heavenly Father, we know that you are all-powerful. We know that you spoke us into existence, and we are so awestruck by your creation. And we pray that your blessings would be upon us as we study tonight. We're so thankful for Brother Brad Harab for the preparation that he's made in his life so that he can conduct this lectureship. We pray that you would uh, bless him, and we pray that his message would be a blessing to, to us and to all those who are watching on the Internet. And we are so thankful for that extended audience. Father, we know that the global flood was a reality. We know that we can learn about your justice and about your salvation as we study it. And we pray that in the second lesson tonight that we would uh, increase our faith through the evidence that's shared. We pray now that you would give us open minds and help us to be able to rate, relate what is said by Brother Harab to your glorious word. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So how did we get here? You know, if, if you have attended a, a church like this one most of your life, that question is not really even a question. You know about the book of Genesis. You know about the Garden of Eden. You know about creation. But what about a child who runs off to school? opens up a textbook, and that textbook begins to teach him something different. Maybe that textbook says something like a, a Big Bang occurred billions of years ago. And I'm going to get my PowerPoint guy to make sure that we're... There we go. Bring back up. There we go. Maybe your textbook talks about the Big Bang. Maybe it talks about the fact that we evolve from some ape-like creature. And so all of a sudden now, this 13-year-old child is sitting there wondering, which one's right? Where did we come from? If you're in this room this evening, I, I want to start by pointing out the very obvious truth that it matters what our children believe about their origins. Amen? You know, when we're teaching things like you're an animal, you share a common heritage with earthworms. Or that we evolved from, from some bacteria billions and billions of years ago. Folks, those kinds of statements plant seeds in the hearts and the minds of young people that will eventually germinate, grow, and lead them away from the faith. If I were to utter the words, the Holocaust, to you this evening, what does that bring to mind? You know, for, for most of you, as you sit there, you think about the war, maybe you think about a young girl by the name of Anne Frank who wrote a diary. Maybe you think about the Jews or Nazis. But I suspect many of you, when you think about the Holocaust, you think about this guy right here, Adolf Hitler. A guy who, whose goal was not just to, to enlarge Germany, his goal was world domination. Now, what would you think if I were to tell you that Adolf Hitler realistically was not the driving force behind the Holocaust? No, in fact, I think it was many, many years earlier in the 1800s, when another guy planted that particular seed in the hearts and the minds of men. His name is Charles Darwin. Charles Darwin was born in Shrewsbury, England. He was born in 1809. His mother died very quickly after his birth, so he was primarily raised by his father. His father was a physician, and guess what Charles Darwin was expected to be? He also was expected to be a physician. 
So at the tender age of 16, they packed him off to Edinburgh University Medical School. But after just one semester there, he realized he didn't like blood. He, he didn't like medicine. Now, remember, this is back in the day before they had anesthesia, and, and part of a medical student's job would to be actually hold down the patient as they were cutting them open. Charles Darwin let his father know this wasn't going to work. So his dad thought about it, realized there was one profession that could actually kind of save or preserve the family name. And that is if Charles Darwin went into the ministry. So they packed him up again, sent him off to Christ College in Cambridge, where he received the only degree that he would ever get. It was a degree, and of all things, theology. Now think about that for just a moment. This guy is elevated as one of the greatest scientists of all time, and yet the only degree he ever got was actually in Bible. Towards the end of his career there at Cambridge, he had a teacher by the name of John Stephen Henslow. Henslow was a priest, he was a, a botanist, and he liked to collect things. So he and Charles Darwin would go out in the countryside and they would try to, to find various plants, various different species. And it was Henslow that realized Charles Darwin, got, he's got a knack for collecting. He's a good naturalist. So he actually got him a job on the HMS Beagle. It was a, a volunteer position. It was supposed to last two years after he graduated. They were going to go all the way around the world collecting things. Ended up lasting five years. And it was on that journey that Charles Darwin, he learned a couple of things about himself. Number one, he learned that he is very, very prone to seasickness. When you read his autobiography, he spends a lot of time talking about being in the, the bowels of that ship, just wishing he would die. But he also learned that he was a pretty good naturalist. He, he was good at collecting things. As he was getting on this boat, he was handed a book by a guy named Charles Lyell. He was given this book as almost a, a joke by one of his friends. The reason I say as a joke was because this particular book back in that day was known to be foolishness. Because this particular book talked about the possibility that things were, were like eons of years old. He took that book with him and they made their journey. They went around the, the tip of South America, came up the western coast, and then they headed out into the sea, and they came across a group of 14 different islands, about 500 miles off the coast of Ecuador, called the Galapagos Islands. About four or five years ago, I had the opportunity to visit the Galapagos Islands to kind of retrace Charles Darwin's steps. And I'll, I'll go ahead and tell you right up front, it is a, an amazing place when it comes to, to diversity, when it comes to all kinds of life. You've got these massive marine iguanas. They, they've got those, those turtles that are big enough that you can actually ride on them. But the thing that really caught his attention were the finches. Thirteen different finches that were there. And he noticed they all had these differences. Some of them had really thick beaks. Some of them had really thin beaks. And he's sitting there thinking to himself, we're 500 miles off the coast of Ecuador. Surely God did not plant 13 different birds on these islands. Surely there was an original pair... And from that, all of these different finches have originated. So in his notes, he actually drew this branching diagram. He completed his journey, 
he came home and he applied that diagram to everything. He thought surely what's happened is there was an original common ancestor that everything came from. So Charles Darwin, he wrote two books, the second of which is called The Descent of Man. Listen to one of the statements that he makes in that. He says, the sole object of this work is to console firstly whether man, like every other species, is descended from some pre-existing form. Secondly, the manner of his development. And thirdly, the value of the differences between the so-called races of man. Races of man? Oh yeah, Charles Darwin most definitely believed in this idea that the dark-skinned people were less evolved than light-skinned people. In fact, those of you who have seen the cover of his book, one of the things that you haven't seen is the full title. The full title, they stopped printing many, many years ago. The full title of his book was The Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection or The Preservation of the Favored Races in the Struggle for Life. Charles Darwin believed that basically the superior race, whether that be in dogs or whether that be in humans, would eventually eliminate the inferior one. Now fast forward to Adolf Hitler. Adolf Hitler, who openly read all of Charles Darwin's writings, and he firmly believed in this idea of survival of the fittest. In fact, what he really wanted to do was jumpstart it in humans and go ahead and get this perfect race. Take a look. This is from a, a book where he, he was given some of his quotes. Adolf Hitler said this. He said, the struggle for world domination will be fought entirely between us between Germans and Jews. All, the el all else is a facade and illusion. Behind England stands Israel, behind France, and behind the United States. Even when we have driven the Jew out of Germany, he remains our world enemy. Adolf Hitler viewed the Jews as an inferior race. And his thought is, if we can just get rid of them, then the human race is going to be stronger. Jerry Bergman, in his book, The Darwinian Worldview, he made this comment. He said, it is estimated that 55 million people died as a re result of the Nazis' war on those persons they regarded as inferior races. Specifically, over 11 million people were murdered directly as a part of the Holocaust, including over 5 million Slavic Christians and 6 million Jews. The Nazis murdered close to to two-thirds of all the Jews then living in Europe, including an estimated 1.1 million children in their quest to create a superior race. In his book, The Descent of Man, listen to what Charles Darwin says. He, he basically predicted what was coming. He said at some point, at some future period, not very distant as measured by centuries, the civilized races of man will almost certainly exterminate and replace throughout the world the savage races. Look carefully at what he's saying. Because folks, it's exactly what Hitler was trying to do. You see, one of the primary causes for the Holocaust was this idea that, that we need to weed out the unfit, that there is a superior race. It's basically Charles Darwin all over. So here's a question for you to think about. Is it possible that today in America we are having a, another Holocaust event? You say, what do you mean? We're, we're not putting people in, in concentration camps. We're, we're not putting them in ovens. Well, think about this for just a moment. Every single day, the United States, roughly 3,000 
unborn children are aborted. 3,000. To the tune of 1.2 million every single year. In fact, out of 100 pregnancies, 22 are going to result in an abortion. And folks, as you look at those numbers, I need you to understand we are experiencing basically a holocaust in America. All because there are people that don't place any value on human life. What's the Holocaust about? I would say today, we look at the unborn and we say, ah, they don't have anything to offer. They're not really human. And now we've actually swung the pendulum the other direction. And now we're looking at the elderly saying, you know what? They don't really have anything to offer. So let's kill them. It's called euthanasia. It's legal now in four different states of the union. We shouldn't be surprised because when you're teaching people that we evolved from bacteria or that, that man came from apes, shouldn't be surprised when we start acting like it, right? And yet all of this is coming from this idea that there is no God, life doesn't have any value, that we just evolved. Let me share you, with you one more thought before we move on. In thinking about us teaching our young people, there was a, a church building in Nazi Germany, a little bit smaller than the one we're currently in. Church building had a, a set of railroad tracks that went right out the back side of it, right across the back. And almost every single Sunday morning, the same scene would play out. The, the people gathered there, they would notice their, their watches, their clocks, and all of a sudden, the singing would get louder. Maybe the, the person to your left or right would start singing louder and louder. Louder it went until finally, the entire room was just bellowing in order to drown out the coming train. It's not a, an imaginative story it's an actual real event because those trains were actually loaded down with Jews and every Sunday morning at a certain time what was happening is those Jews were coming by on their way to a concentration camp and folks here's the disturbing part Instead of the Christians actually doing something, instead of them actually getting out of their seat, instead of them actually getting active, you know what they did? They just sang louder. And I'm afraid that's what we're doing today. Oh, we know that abortions happen. We, we know that we're starting to kill our elderly. And instead of actually doing something... We just sing louder. Why does any of this matter? I mean, what, why does it matter if we're teaching our, our young people that they evolve from some ape-like creature? Or, or what does it matter if we look at God as a, a, a creator directly or if maybe he used evolution? Or what does it matter if it was six days or, or six billion years Folks, it matters because the very foundation of God's word is being compromised. Think about it. If you can't trust the opening chapters of God's word, why would you trust anything to follow? Ultimately, it matters because those foundations mean that that there was sin and the need of a redeemer, and ultimately if there was no creator, then how do you know there's going to be a savior? I, I teach people that there should be three divisions in the Bible. I know you guys know two, Old and New Testament, right? I, I teach people to think of it in terms of three divisions, and the reason I do that 
is so that hopefully you'll get the picture better that I think God was trying to give us. God's original plan was what? That we would be with him in a garden. You ever thought about that? They, they never had to think about dying. They didn't have to think about disease and death. They were with God. They, they didn't think about, oh, I hope I get to heaven. Because they were already in his presence. Genesis chapters 1 and 2, we're like this with God. Then put a division in Genesis 3. Because that's where our relationship was severed. Permanently. And now all of a sudden sin enters the picture. The entire rest of the Bible from Genesis 3 all the way to the book of the Revelation is trying to tell us how to get back into that covenant relationship ultimately through Jesus Christ. You look at, at Genesis 3, 14 and 15. The very first messianic prophecy. When God is telling the serpent here, you may bruise his heel, but ultimately he's going to crush your head. Because folks, again, if you think about it, if there was no garden, if there was no Adam, if there was no sin, then basically all you got is a bunch of dirt. A cosmic explosion. This is the picture that evolution wants you to think. A me but a man. If you've got a Bible, go ahead and open it up to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2, take a look with me at verse 15. Then the Lord God took man, put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. First point that I want to make. Man was expected to work. He was intelligent enough to tend and keep this garden. Now, look at the next verse, verse 16. The Lord God commanded man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. Point number two, man was smart enough to know right from wrong. God said, you can have all these trees, but this one is mine. Now skip down to verse 20. So Adam gave name to all the cattle, to the birds of the air, to every beast of the field. So God parades the animals in front of him saying, I want you to name them. The implication being he's not to just name them, he's to remember that name and pass it on to his offspring. Now, Think about that for just a moment. Smart enough to work. Knows right from wrong. Intelligent enough to name the animals. And yet all three of those points occurred before Eve was even fashioned. Now folks, if you can squeeze that into that right there, I'd love to see it. Because you see, the Bible talks about man being created with intelligence. We were literally the, the pinnacle of God's creation. And then through sin, we fell. Totally different picture than this idea of amoeba to man. The catch is, we get this in the mailbox, and we get this in the, the textbooks. And it sells the idea that, you know, maybe we got all these bones that prove we evolved. Maybe... Maybe we came from some ape-like creature, as Charles Darwin would have us believe. Take a look. This is a, a quote that he put in his second book. He said, There is no fundamental difference between man and the higher mammals in their mental faculties. Okay, I don't know about you. I've never seen any other animal... Take a, a piece of wood, put some carbon inside of it, and write a poem. Or, or maybe write a, a song and then play it on a musical instrument. But again, these pictures, these pictures are very convincing to our children. Notice the one on the right. Big bold heading, How Apes Became Human. 
It's in this particular Time magazine that they're announcing the arrival of the latest missing link. Scientific name, Artipithecus Romidus Cadaba. He goes by Artie for short. It's interesting. Anytime you see pictures like that, especially the young people in this room, I, I want you to remember to ask this question. Where's all the evidence? You know, if you're going to tell me that we evolved from some ape, where's your evidence for it? Because when you open up the magazine, here's what you discover. They don't have a whole lot of bones. In fact, this is it. If you orient yourself, the top right over here, those are all finger bones. You got a single toe bone. These are molars. You got the head of a femur. All the ones in the middle are teeth. On the right hand side, you've got part of the mandible, some long bones of the arm. That's it. That's all they've got. And from that, they're going to say, this is how apes became human. And yet, notice one of the admissions they make in this magazine. They say, Hale Celeste and his colleagues haven't collected enough bones yet to reconstruct with great precision what Kadaba looked like. But they do know that it was about the size of a modern common chimpanzee, which when standing, averaged about four feet tall. All right, so let me get this straight. We haven't collected enough bones yet to know what this guy looks like, and yet we're going to put his picture on the cover of Time and in a two-page spread of the magazine, and we're going to put his picture in museums and textbooks. Oh, but that's not the best part. The best part is this right here. In that magazine where they're announcing to the world that they've got this missing link, They've got a picture of that single toe bone. Now, remember, this is the only bone they have below the head of the femur. And they say, this toe bone proves the creature walked on two legs. Now, folks, human foot's got 26 bones. They have one. And yet, I want you to notice an admission they make about that toe bone talking about it, buried in this article, they say this. Not only is it separated in time by several hundred thousand years, but it was also found some ten miles away from the rest of those bones. Guess it just walked away? I mean, think about that for just a moment. Imagine if you're out front, you're digging, you find a toe bone. You call a buddy 10 miles away who you know has got some fossils. Hey, I, I, I found a toe bone. I think it goes with your collection. You know what he'd say? You're crazy. And yet, by their own dating methods, they're saying, yeah, this guy, it's a couple hundred thousand years difference in age, but we're going to glue it all together and we're going to say this proves the creature walked upright on two legs. What I want to do this evening before I allow you to have a break is I want to walk you through what I call is evolution's hall of shame. It's a long hallway, got a lot of doors. This is the hall that our children rarely see because in the textbooks it's presented as fact. This guy on the screen is my favorite. My favorite candidate for evolution's hall of shame. It's called Nebraska Man. Now, Nebraska man was actually presented as evidence for evolution during the Scopes monkey trial. Some of you guys remember hearing about that. It was put in the paper, Illustrated London News, in 1922. They said, hey, we found the missing link. This is it. So again, we asked that question, okay, where, where's the evidence? If, if you're going to use this as Evidence in a trial, if you're going to put a picture in the, uh, uh, a worldwide paper, where's your evidence? All the evidence comes from a single tooth. Looks like four on the screen behind me. That's actually the same tooth taken from four different vantage points. From that one tooth, they came up with this guy and his wife. 
Just a, a little bit of artistic license there, right? Here's the interesting part. After giving it a scientific name, after using it in the Scopes Monkey Trial, after putting it in the Illustrated London News, they later discovered that that one tooth actually belonged to an extinct pig. Not exactly a missing link. Or how about this guy, Piltdown Man? There you see on the, the screen uh, an artist's depiction of what he would allegedly look like. So we ask that question. Where's the evidence? I mean, if you're, you're going to infect my child's mind with the idea that he evolved, well, where's the evidence for it? This time we've got to go to a gravel pit in Piltdown, England. All the way back in 1912, 1912 they discovered some pieces of a skull, pieces of a jawbone. They glued it all together, they presented it to the world, and for roughly 40 years this guy was touted as the missing link. 40 years. Put in museums, put in textbooks. Took us 40 years to realize we had been lied to. Because here's what they actually did. They actually took a, a fairly modern skull. They broke it on purpose. They took the jawbone of an orangutan. They filed down the back teeth of that orangutan to make it look more human. They then dipped the whole thing in acid to age it. And then they buried it only to discover it later on. Forty years. And for 40 years, people bought it. Or how about this guy? Orc man, found in Spain. Again, we ask the question, where's the evidence? This time, it's a single bone that comes from basically right on the back side of your head. Your, your parietal occipital region of your skull. For those of you men in this room who are um, having a little hair loss issue, it's right back there on that spot. You'll notice on the screen behind me, green painted area, and then right below that, you'll notice they made a cast of it. But I want you to look kind of carefully at that cast. Because one of the things you'll notice with, with the person holding it underneath, the brain cavity for that skull was pretty small. And they couldn't figure out how in the world did we go from this small brain with that kind of curvature to the modern brain. Well, in 1980, they decided maybe it's a piece from a child. So what did they do? 1982... They put it in all the scientific papers, they announced it, roll out the banners, rewrite the textbooks. They've got the oldest human fossil record ever discovered in Europe. Only to later realize, oops, that one piece of bone probably came from a six-month-old donkey. Not exactly a missing link. Guys, that's not science, that's, that's Hollywood. That, that's make-believe, that's once upon a time kind of stuff. The way they're getting away with it is this. They go out and, and they find bone fragments. So on the screen behind me, you see what they're calling a, a homo erectus fossil, upright walking man. Now you might think that's what they actually found in the dirt. No, that, that's actually more than 30 different bone fragments recovered from more than five different locations. I, I tell people there's more Elmer's glue in that right there than in a kindergarten classroom. They, they found all these fragments, they glue them together. Now, why would they do that? Now, folks, let me be straight up front with you. I don't know the heart and the intent of every single scientist, but I do know that there's two things that drive almost every human. One of them is this right here, and one of them is fame. Money comes from grants. You, you write a grant, you say, hey, I, I'm going to go look in this region to see if I can find 
any early evidence for mankind. Usually grants are three to five years. First couple of years, you know what the scientist does? He kind of kicks back and relaxes. But by year three, you know what he has to do? He has to show something in order to get his grant renewed. So they began to find a tooth here and some bones here and some more teeth over here. And it doesn't matter that they're totally different creatures, different areas. He glues them all together and says, look what I found. Now, what I'm showing you on the screen, that's not good enough to convince our kids. So what they do is they invite a scientific illustrator to come in and make a cast of that. And that's what you see in museums. That, that's what you see with those little placards that say, this guy lived 1.5 million years ago. But again, that's not even good enough really to convince our kids. So they invite him back. They ask the, the scientific illustrator, maybe flesh him out a little bit, put some eyes on him, put some skin on him. And lo and behold, we've gone from roughly 30 bone fragments in five different locations to making it look like you just went out back and took his picture. And yet, folks, if you really look at that, to me, it kind of looks like the movie Shrek or, or maybe an NFL linebacker. The point is, there's a whole lot of fudging and finagling going on. Some of you in this room remember hearing about a, a discovery called Lucy. I actually sat in a biology class, had a professor tell me that Lucy was the missing link. This was what linked us back to the apes. Lucy's real name is Australopithecus afarensis. Now, the guy who discovered her is this guy right here, Donald Johansson became very famous, very wealthy after his discovery. For those of you who don't know the, the background on Lucy's name, she is one of the, the most complete fossils ever discovered from one area. The night that they made the discovery, they're in a camp in the far region of Africa. They're out there, they've got a, a record player, and it was playing over and over and over the same song. Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds, and the name stuck. Donald Johansson made this discovery over 25 years ago. Now, since that time, we've actually had the opportunity to examine the fossils, to actually look, do some comparisons, do measurements. I spent several months of my life doing anatomical comparisons, and I'm not going to go through this whole list with you. But I, I do want to point out one or two things, like, for instance, the second point on the screen. Talks about her having locked wrist. You know, when you go to the zoo and you watch a, a, a monkey, an ape, they're quadrupeds. They, they walk on all fours. Well, guess what? So does Lucy. Maggie Fox said, a chance discovery made by looking at a cast of the bones of Lucy, the most famous fossil of Australopithecus afarensis, shows that her wrist is stiff like a chimpanzee's. She goes on to say, this suggests that her ancestors walked on their knuckles. Well, that's interesting because when she was first presented, they told us she was upright like us. She was on her way to becoming a human. Or how about this? How about her rib cage? The, the fourth point that you see there on the screen. You know, anatomically speaking, all humans, everybody in this room, you have a, a barrel-shaped rib cage. Okay? Now some of us got bigger barrels than others, but we all have barrel-shaped rib cages. That's not the same with chimps. Chimps have conical shaped rib cage. It actually gets smaller as you go down, kind of like an ice cream cone. When Lucy was first presented in scientific journals, they said, hey, she's got a barrel shaped rib cage. She's on her way to becoming a human. And then they started sending replicas 
of her fossils to museums all across the, the country. Take a look at what Peter Schmidt wrote when they got their Lucy replica. He said, when I started to put the skeleton together, I expected it to look human. Everyone had talked about Lucy being very modern, very human. So I was surprised by what I saw. I noticed the ribs were more round in cross-section, more like what you see in apes. He said, human ribs are flatter in cross-section. But the shape of the rib cage itself was the biggest surprise of all. He said, the human rib cage is barrel-shaped, and I just couldn't get Lucy's ribs to fit this kind of shape. But I could get them to make a conical-shaped rib cage, like what you see in apes. You see, when you actually examine the evidence of Lucy, what you realize is she was nothing more than an adult pygmy chimp. And yet, even then, we've got problems. Because many of you have seen a picture just like this one in your textbook. Now, here's a question. <laughs> Which one's right? Because on the screen behind me, I am presenting to you eight different pictures that are supposedly all authentic pictures of Lucy's skeletal remains. Take a little bit better look. Look, look at the skull or, or the jaw. How about this? Take a look at the ribs. How, how many ribs does she have? Because some of these, some of them she's got five, some of them she's got seven. It's kind of like that old game show. You remember where they used to say, would the real so-and-so please stand up? Except Lucy can't because she was a quadruped on all fours. went to the St. Louis Museum a couple of years ago, and there was a, a big display to Darwin, I mean, just a, a shrine to evolution, and they had a, a life-size standing thing of Lucy. And I'm looking at this thing thinking, wait a second, hold up. They've got Lucy's legs and feet? Let me back up for you for just a minute. So right about here. How many feet bone do they collect? None. In fact, if you look, this is the junction of the knee right here. They didn't get anything really past this point. So how would they know what her feet look like? Or, or how about this? In that life-size replica, she got lots and lots of hair. How much hair do those bones tell you they have? They don't. We actually pointed this out to zoo officials. We said, look, you guys are extrapolating to the point that this really isn't teaching. I mean, what you're doing is you're indoctrinating. And they responded. In fact... Bruce Carr, one of the zoo officials, he wrote back, I want you to read what he said about this particular exhibit. He said, zoo officials have no plans to knuckle under. We cannot be updating every exhibit based on every new piece of evidence. We look at the overall exhibit and the impression it creates. We think the overall impression this exhibit creates is correct. In other words, it sells the picture they wanted to sell. Let's look at one more before I let you guys take a break. What about Neanderthal man? Now, I realize some of the ladies in this room right now are thinking, yeah, I live with him. Okay, just because your husband acts like him doesn't mean evolution is true, okay? This is National Geographic's cover boy. They, they love Neanderthal man. By the way, how many of you in this room over the age of 40 remember getting National Geographic magazine in your home? Let me see your hand. Talk to an elder in the church. Previous elder in the church. Man was in his late 60s. And we were talking about why he completely 
walked away from the church. He told me, he said, Brad, I just can't harmonize it. He said, I can't harmonize all that I learned with the Bible. He said something had to give. And so he said it was the Bible that gave. He went on to relay to me the fact that all during his childhood years, his parents got two magazines every single month. National Geographic and Life magazine. Some of you remember Life magazine. He said, I can remember sitting in the basement of our house, going through every single page, looking at those ancient cavemen. Now folks, listen to me. This is a guy in his 60s who was an elder of the church who has abandoned the church. If you don't think that those pictures can plant seeds. Neanderthal man, what do we know about this guy? On the screen behind me, you see a, a picture of what they would say is a Neanderthal skull. And in the background is a human skull. Basically, the only difference is this, this brow ridge that they got right here. So what do they say? According to them, this is our closest relative. This is what gave rise to Homo sapiens. So they would point out you've got the apes, you've got this long string, and then you get to Neanderthal man who gives rise to us. Are our, supposedly our closest relative. Here's the problem. What they don't say is that in 1958, a guy by the name of Dr. A.J. Cave, he actually examined the original Neander Valley fossils. And you know what he discovered? He discovered that it was somebody who had suffered from advanced cases of arthritis. Now here's a question. Does arthritis change bone structure? In fact, in this room right now, as I'm looking at you, there are people who are suffering from arthritis. There are people who probably have osteoporosis, other bone disorders. My mom right now, she is struggling with rheumatoid arthritis. You know what it's doing? It's changing her bone structure. Now think about that for just a moment. Just because somebody has a difference, does that make it a, a new evolved creature? No. In this room alone, you know, as I'm looking at you, I see all kinds of, of differences. I see, you know, normal heads and little heads and fat heads and all kinds. I'll point out the fat heads later. Here's the interesting thing. If we were fossilized tonight and they came back and dug us up, there are a few of you in this room who would well qualify as Neanderthals. I'll point you out later too. What I hope you understand is that just because something is a little bit different doesn't mean it's a new species, it's a, a new thing. By the way, Neander Valley, Germany is where these things were found. Why is that a big deal to me? As a scientist, I recognize that's part of, of northern Europe that doesn't get a whole lot of sunlight. And we need sunlight. We actually use sunlight to make vitamin D. Anybody in this room ever notice in the wintertime, you, sometimes you maybe have the blues, you don't feel as good. It's actually a real thing. We take sunlight, we make vitamin D. Without vitamin D, guess what you're not able to do? You can't absorb calcium properly. So does it make sense from a logical perspective that we might find some bones around Neander Valley, Germany that might not be exactly the way everybody else is because they're not getting vitamin D? Yeah. So a buddy of mine by the name of Jack Cuzo, who studied the Neanderthal fossils a lot better than I have. He wrote a book called Buried Alive. I want you to read what he had to say about it. 
He said, you must understand that this skull really cries out disease. He said, the teeth are badly decayed. The bones of the vault of the skull are extremely thick. He said, there are many features that testify of acromelgia or excessive secretion of growth hormone in adulthood. What, what, what are you saying, Jacker? Are you saying that this is a new species that we evolved? No, he's saying it's a, a diseased human. What does the fossil record really show? I, I'm going to let a guy by the name of Jeremy Rifkin tell you because I, I think he summed it up beautifully. He said, what the record shows is nearly a century, we're talking a hundred years of fudging and finagling by scientists attempting to force various fossil morsels and fragments to conform with Darwin's notions, all to no avail. He said, today the millions of fossils stand as very visible, ever-present reminders of the paltriness of the arguments and the overall shabbiness of the theory that marches under the banner of evolution. Friends, I hope and I pray that when you see those pictures that you will immediately ask this question, where is the evidence? Because the true evidence points to this. God created apes and God created man. And in man, the text says this, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Those three words, us, our, and our, those are plural. Which tells me there was a conference of the Godhead that came together with the creation of man. What does it mean to be made in his image? Does that mean God has hands like mine? Or, or a cute face like mine? No, God is a spirit, as we talked about last night. Those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So if God is a spirit and we're made in his image, what part of us was made in his image? That would be our spirit, our soul. Folks, please don't miss this point. The danger, the deadliness of the evolutionary theory is that it is ripping the soul out of man and turning us just into another animal. And there are consequences for that. When we come back, we're going to talk a little bit about the flood. What, what, what kind of evidence do we have for that? Was there really a global flood? I mean, surely God wouldn't kill that many people, right? I mean, I mean not, not God. We're going to take about a 10-minute break, let you guys get up, stretch your legs. Restrooms are in the rear. For those of you who have been looking at that table in the back, let me encourage you, pick up a copy of Think Magazine. They are free. We want you to have them. I've got more out in my, my vehicle. These are, it's written by faithful Christians every single month. This is the January 2018 issue, and it is encouraging you not to just make a resolution to be a stronger Christian. It's giving you ways to do that. So, like I say, there are copies of this on the back table back there. They're free. Pick them up. If you don't get this in your home, I hope you'll consider that. Thank you. We'll take a break.